fun. Welcome back, guys. Um, we're getting toward the end of the class. There's only going to be so many more lectures. Um, for this one, we're going to finish out Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the sort of stuff that you need to think about when you're when you're working on your on your second paper about bringing in a a a theme or motif or idea and try to uh, bring in lots of different stories. We're going to talk about um, we're going to wrap up Lovecraft Country. We're going to talk about what we think Matt Ruff was talking about, some of the some of the aspects he was talking about, as well as just talk about all three um, stories um, at the same time. Did it's probably also for those of you who have read read it uh, read all the reading so far, you may be confused by Mark of Cain. That's because um, Mark of Cain brings in the entire it, it wraps up the entire book, and we. We, we're not making you guys read the entire book. So I guess I just want to mention a few th simple things that will help you understand that last that last story. The first one is um, Hippolyta. And that is the wife of Uncle George, who we've met so far in the story. She has her own little story where she goes off to Wisconsin and she ends up going to a different planet. And I won't go into the story, but one of the things that happens is when she comes back is a monster follows her back to this world and ends up killing some people. And then that feeds into the storyline because those people were members of the Chicago Lodge. And so when we get to the last story, there is this idea that somehow this is all a manipulation of Caleb to have these people killed and things stolen, stuff like that. And I'll just to let you know, again, um, the characters in the story have a little bit deeper knowledge than Caleb does because this is something that happened to Hippolyta. A second thing that happens in the story is we were, we were introduced to the character of Ruby, who we meet in the second story. Uh, we meet her uh, to begin with in uh, Dreams in the Witch House, which is one of the stories you're, you're reading. And the important thing to understand about her is she ends up being able, she's given an elixir that allows her to jump back and forth between bodies. In fact, the, the story is called Jekyll and Hyde Park, and it's playing around with the idea of Jekyll and Hyde. So the, the Ruby story is about the fact that she's able to both be... Uh, white and black she is a white uh a white character called hilda i believe hillary 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 um but she's also ruby uh again uh leticia's sister yeah Letia. she's leticia's sister uh ruby and ruby uh uh by benefit of an elixir a blood elixir provided to her by caleb uh braithwaite uh, she, she's able to do a Jekyll and Hyde transformation and become this white redhead uh, that she names Hillary. Okay, and she and Hillary makes an appearance in our in our story uh, in, in the Mark of Cain in our last uh, chapter. There, the last thing you need to know is that um, um, Hippolyta and George's son um, Horace is cursed, and the curse is eventually broken. But all of these stories come together, again, in the last story, Mark of Cain. But again, just to give you a brief, a brief breakdown of what's going on, so it makes, the last story makes a little bit more sense than if, if you know these little facts when you're reading that last story of Mark and Cain. Um, but we're going to start off with talking about um, dreams in the witch house. And specifically, I think we're going to start off by basically taking something, just a small little thing that, that appears over and over again in these stories, and just talking about it. And we're going to talk about idols. We're going to talk about the fact that one of the things that, that we see over and over again in these stories are idols. We, re, we were reminded of the, of the statues, the ancient Greco-Roman statues that appeared in the white people. We're reminded of the, the statue of, of Cthulhu that appears in the Call of Cthulhu. Uh, we are reminded of um, the Black God. The Black God is this huge idol within this temple-like structure that uh, Jory uh, must take the kiss from in order to exact her revenge. Gerald of Jory. Oh, Gerald of Jory, sorry. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what the, all these statues have in common. And me and Peter thought it over and we talked about it uh, uh, quite a bit. And we realized that one of these things that the, the, the idols stand for is this idea of this transition, of this conduit between these two worlds. You can yeah. think of it as a statue is standing one foot in, in both the mundane world, what we're calling the mundane world, 
and the weird world or the supernatural weird world. And it, it's 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 it serves to show to serve as a gateway. Sometimes it serves as a guardian, but it always serves as a marker or a conduit between these two worlds. It, it, exactly. And while on the one hand, the base relief of Cthulhu that Henry Wilcox sculptures on the basis of his dream connection to Cthulhu, on the one hand, these are sources of dread and terror and horror. We're meant to recoil. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Cthulhu statue is meant to inspire the kind of dread we associate with the awful geometry of Riala, the city that momentarily rises from the depths of the sea, at least the Acropolis does. But these statues also, as conduits for cosmic otherness, for the weird, okay, are part of this process of empowerment that we've been hinting at. And now, since we're talking about the new weird, okay, it's really really important to see a principle of reversal here where the statue okay connects us with a source of power it's not simply meant as a motif okay to frighten us in reversal okay we harness the power of that other we we connect with that other universe and own it in a sense as our own we identify with it. It it is in us what that statue represents. It's a statue representing something we are, something that we have to embrace about ourselves. And in the story dreams in the witch house, what statue are we talking about? We're talking about the 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 Greek goddess of the moon and witchcraft, I believe. Hecate. Uh, Hecate. 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 T Hecate, yes. And we know that because we looked it up on the internet. Yes, um. <laughs> that's right. It, it must be true. We must be getting it right. But Hecate, uh, yes. And Hecate, uh, we encounter he the statue of Hecate as this gaudy, extravagant statue uh, in the middle of Harem House. The the the, uh, the, the I'm sorry, Winthrop House. The, the house, okay, that Hiram Winthrop built. And what we ultimately learn is this house is a kind of conduit. And the statue, the statue is crucial to a ritual that will be performed. Okay. Montrose, okay, Atticus' father, Montrose, okay, will complete the circuit represented by this house uh, by offering a satchel. In the mark, in the mark of Cain, he offers a satchel that has ashes but also the notebooks of Hiram Winthrop. And Hiram Winthrop then accepts this offering, okay, through the idol, accepts this offering through the statue of Hecate, and in a sense completes a metaphysical circuit that makes available the rules of this other universe, the rules of cosmic otherness as a source of power for Montrose, Atticus, Uncle Barry, and for everybody involved in what's going to happen at the end of the Mark of Cain. And we're also reminded I'm of the- I'm sorry, I leaped to the Mark of Cain. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're also reminded of the dream that Letitia has in Dreams of the Witch House. And she the dream is about her mother and her mother becomes wrapped up in this, 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 this statue. So, and we re were reminded that her mother was a fortune teller, that she spent- her spare time doing small seances or, or small fortune telling to people in the neighborhood. So she represents that bridge into the supernatural. And we realize that Leticia in this dream is, she thinks it's her mother, but in the end, but toward the end of the dream, she realizes it actually is the statue of uh, Hecate, Hecate, Hecate uh, that has touched her and is, and is talking to her. And so in, we're reminded in real life, okay, Ruby is jostling the shoulder of the shoulder of Leticia trying to wake her up. In the dream, in the dream, okay, Leticia is fearing the arrival of her mother, who of course has already passed away, but a fearing, fearing her imminent arrival. And she does arrive and she does enter this house. 
this, in a sense, something about the authority of the mother and her ability to connect with another world, to connect and channel the dead. Okay, the dream tells us is happening through this statue. And in the dream, the statue puts a bronze hand on the shoulder of Letitia. It's an empowerment motif. And so we're reminded again of also the black God and the idea of kissing it. Right. We're reminded of the, um, again, the, the white statues, the Greco-Roman statues that must be destroyed so that no one else can pass over into uh, over into the other world in the white people. And so again, we're just giving you a simple example of, of, a, of, of, a, of a simple idea or theme or trope that appears in all these different stories. And making connections be between them, seeing what these all have in common with each other. And we thought we'd go with statues because we thought it was interesting because we, we were kind of asking, what's the deal with the statue? Okay, uh, but let's uh, let's go ahead now. If we need to come back to uh, Witch House, that's great. But let's go ahead now and talk about Abdullah's book. Okay, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll get us right, right to the threshold here of the treasure room. Okay. Um, Okay. Hiram Winthrop, okay, okay, had had ordered built this secret room that violates ordinary rules, okay. And in this in this room is a chest, and in this chest is the Book of Names, not the Necronomicon, which is a book of the dead, but this is a book of names, and this confers the kind of power that the Adamite cult, the Sons of Adam. Okay, are very interested in because it confers the confers the power of naming from the Bible, naming in the Book of Genesis. That naming process, that naming is an elemental magic, for lack of a better term. Okay, by which we, as natural philosophers or wizards, can shape the very nature of reality. So the the Book of Names is in a chest. Okay, suspended at the end of a chain in this treasure room and at first montrose okay experiments a little a little bit okay uncle uncle barry and atticus hold his belt and then they realize they have a better idea they put a rope around little mortimer dupree okay and shoot him and shoot him out into this circular space where the treasure chest is is hovering okay at the end of a chain Eventually, they realize, oh, they could, they just feel around for a button, okay, at, at the bottom of where they're standing at that doorway, and they're able to bring the chest closer, okay. But we have a wonderful adventure of Mortimer Dupree trying to navigate this space and dodge this torpedo, okay, this torpedo which has a propeller, okay, it eventually lodges in the, in the floating, desiccated, decomposing body of a former lodge, lodge master and uh Un uncle barry george barry is able to shoot it and stop and stop uh the torpedo from working okay uh uh boy okay i'm getting carried away okay let me let me turn it back over to you um what, what struck me about this chapter and we both me and peter have talked about this is this chapter is looking at different forms of racism. Um, we, we've already talked about the fact that we've, we've come across those Sundowner towns. We've come across the fact of the people trying to, to vandalize and, and, and they were throwing excrement at, at the Winthrop house in the earlier chapter. Right, back very, in the Winthrop house. Very overt forms of, of racism. What we're getting in this of chapter is more of the systematic racism, the, the racism that that's 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 more invisible. And one of the great examples of that is, as Peter said, what do the sons of Adams do? They name things. You know who also named things? Slave owners. Slave owners named all, renamed all the uh, the slaves as they came um, from across the 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 uh, the African trade um, trade system. And, and that was a form of depowerment. That was a way of taking away, I'm going to take away your name and I will give you a name that I see fit for you because you are now mine. And, and again, the book of names is bringing up, not necessarily directly, but it, it is reminding us of that type of dynamic. And there is another type of racism in here as well. One of the things that happens at the end of the book, which comes out of nowhere, which surprises us all, is the fact that Caleb pays off what is called what, what Abdullah has called the debt of slavery. 
all of the things that all the wrongs that the white people have done because of slavery to her and and, and her and her to Ada A D A H Ada okay, which is a a great grandmother a forebear of Uncle Barry. But Georgia. she is she has basically calculated out how much the white people owe her because of slavery, and she's also calculated for for inflation. So not only does, is the original uh, is the original uh, uh, amount is shown, but the, the the inflation has been added to it to know how much. The, well, is interest going... is accruing when, it, yeah. when, when, when until the principal oh, interest is, limit not, not inter inflation. interest accrues, and and there's a family reunion ritual. The family, the Barry family. Um, Including uh, including the Turner side of the family, okay, because George Berry and Montrose Turner are half brothers, okay. Um, at one point, uh, Montrose's uh, forebear, Mon Mon uh, uh, Montrose's uh, father, takes the name of Turner because he doesn't want the name that a lot of families have which is really a slave owner name it's a plantation name and and so uh that accounts for why Montrose has a different last name okay the uh in in any case the uh the 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 family the descendants of Ada okay they gather at the bank at that safe deposit box every year and they increase the amount of money owed to Ada, okay, for her suffering and for her hard work. Okay, that's the family ritual. And of course, that's the debt with interest, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, that Caleb Braithwaite pays off at the at the end of the story. It's really a reparations model. Yeah. But here's um, the yeah. here's the not, thing. Not is... to imply that Caleb Braithwaite is a great guy. <laughs> Okay, he's very manipulative now, isn't he? And here's the thing I think Mutt Ruff is trying to talk about. He's trying to talk about a modern racism. And modern racism may not be, I don't want anything ill of, the, of these people. I do not wish them ill. I wish, in fact, I wish them the best. In fact, I want them to succeed. But very much also the idea of they must know their place. The idea that, that minorities must know their place. They must know that the white males are on top. And as long as they, they follow in line and do as I say, I will reward them greatly. I will heap treasures upon them, but they must always do what I say. That is the model that Caleb is giving. Caleb Braithwaite's racism is very different than Samuel Braithwaite's. Samuel Braithwaite's racism is much more of the, oh my God, I hate these people. I wish them all dead. Caleb does not want anyone dead. He, he really likes Atticus. But again, it's, 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 it's that more subtle form of racism, that systematic racism. That racism that's in place to 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 prevent people from reaching their full empowerment. Well, um, uh, we need to to remember something, and it's easy to forget, but it's going to be important here uh, for the way we conclude this video. Let us not forget that Atticus and Caleb are brothers. Let's they go straight share, into that. They share a bloodline. They are both, okay, sons among sons. Uh, they, well, they I'll, are, put, I'll put you they one better. Cain and Abel. They are the sons of Adam. Who are the sons of Adam? They're the true they, sons of Adam, yes. They are Cain and Abel. That's right. And so we get into the next story, which is, um, which is the mark of Cain. Again, it might be a little confusing, you guys. Because you guys haven't read the full story, but just if it's something confusing, you just keep reading, and you'll get the basic idea behind it. Uh, but we wanted to get, we wanted to do the downfall of Caleb in it, and, and and really in this chapter, Matt Ruff really puts out his main ideas. But it's interesting in the fact that there is this mark of Cain, there is this ritual that has been done on Caleb's chest, and we find in part of it that Atticus changes that ritual. He has, through extraordinary means, he has, as Peter has mentioned earlier. Um, basically, they have made peace with Winthrop. They have made peace with the ghost of a dead lodge master. And through him, they have learned their own form of magic or how to alter the magic that's on Caleb. And Atticus does that in the last scene. He puts his own mark on Caleb. And Peter likes to call it the mark of Abel, or more likely the, the mark of Atticus. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Caleb tried to take back the piece of paper with Adamite language and the sacred knife, the magical knife 
that he temporarily confers on Atticus. He wants to take those back after the circuit is completed and Captain Lancaster and his thugs are defeated. But Atticus hung on to them and he used that knife apparently to cut his palm, okay? And he takes that bloody palm and he presses it against uh, Caleb Braithwaite. Remember, Montrose is the one who came up with this technique because he offered the satchel of of ashes, the satchel that contains the notebooks of Hiram Winthrop to Hecate, to the statue, and they complete a ritual that bridges two worlds. They, the rules of the other universe, they become our rules. These two universes are bridged in the ritual, and that's represented by everybody freezing in time. Everybody is stop motion, and something happens in that basement later that Montrose presides over, okay, and it culminates in uh, Atticus cutting his palm and pressing that bloody palm, remember the importance of bloodline, against the chest, the mark of Cain, which is the mark of immunity or protection that Caleb enjoys, and changes it. There are all kinds of ways we could speculate on the implication of those changes, but we know it's a bonding and it's a protection. A mark of Abel, just like a mark of Cain, is a protection spell. And what Atticus is doing is saving the life of Caleb Braithwaite. Oh, Montrose would have been happy if all this ended with the death of Caleb Braithwaite. And since the whole trajectory, the momentum, the energy of the story has been going towards a repetition of the death of Samuel Braithwaite, Caleb repeats the error of, of his father and pays for killing his father. He's responsible for the death of his father. Atticus resists something that Ryan and I have been talking about. In so many in so many ways, what the new weird is about is what to do with reversal. Reversal is how cosmic otherness becomes a force of empowerment. And if it does, if it does, well, then maybe Professor Harding has an important decision to make. In Elizabeth Baer's story, Shogoths and Bloom, he has an important decision to make. He can become a master an authority, an elder thing in his own right, and command the power of the Shogoths for world domination. And, and why not? Why not that kind of revenge? Okay. Why should Caleb Braithwaite live? Doesn't he deserve to die at the hands? And then we think it through. At the hands of his brother, that would mean Atticus Turner becomes Cain and kills his brother. Atticus chooses not to do so. Decisions are important. That's the only way we can stop reversal. That's what we mean by normalization. The cosmic other becomes a set of levers, becomes a tool, becomes a weapon. It's in us and it's who we are. And it's a tremendous power we can wield. But how do we stop reversal be from becoming revenge? This is something Ryan has been talking about as well. The new weird is about breaking the cycle and not finishing reversal, stopping short, not engaging in revenge. And at the end, um, Caleb says, well, why didn't you kill me? And Atticus says, we decided not to. We. He's not acting as, as the lodge master. He is not I, acting as... I know you have a very important thought. And I know how you wanted to conclude this. You wanted to conclude this with the laughter of Atticus. Yes. With the laughter of Atticus and his friends. They just they just start laughing because Caleb says, well, you don't know what kind of problem you're in now. You're effectively a kind of lodge now among each other. You are together a lodge. And the other lodge is just because Captain Lancaster's gone and the Chicago Lodge is gone. Maybe you are the Chicago Lodge now. There are other lodges, and these people are going to be out for you, and they're not going to care about you. They're not going to think of you as family, okay? They're not going to think of you at all. They're, they're, uh, you don't realize the danger you're in, and our characters start laughing. And I think really what ha what's happening here is um, Matt Ruff is making a statement to Lovecraft. It's called Lovecraft Country. That that statement was was is very much in the Lovecraft thing. You don't understand. 
The world is a dangerous place. There is all these, these secret supernatural things going on that you don't recognize and you don't understand the danger you're in. And I think Matt Ruff is kind of saying that comes from a place of privilege. That comes from a, a place of the patriarchy. That comes from a place of people who are in power who the only thing they really fear is losing that power or finding out that the foundation of that power is wrong or is immaterial. That's really the fear of the Lovecraft story is that, again, we talk about that existential horror. What is the ultimate existential horror of Lovecraft? It's the fact that the, his belief system, his white supremacy belief system might be wrong. It, it might be the other that has it, that has it, that, that is actually the more powerful one. It might be the other, which is smarter. It might be the other that is more in tune with happiness and, and a sense of community. And that's kind of what, what happens in this story is, is basically Matt Ruff says, those who aren't in power understand this innately. They understand this almost from birth because this is the world they live in. They live in a world that is dangerous. And it's not dangerous because of the weird. It's dangerous because of the mundane. Again, it's dangerous because of Jim Crow laws. It's dangerous because of the of the huge injustices that people that in many ways Lovecraft represents are enforcing upon the rest of the world. So when Atticus says, you don't understand, I think it's a lot of Matt Ruff responding back to Lovecraft saying, you didn't really understand what you were saying when you were talking about these these Lovecraftian stories, you didn't understand the real messages you were teaching to those of us who aren't in power, for those of us who are the outsiders and are used to being the outsiders. Well, with that, uh, we, we close out our, our last Matt Ruff uh, video. This is our last video for uh, Weird SA2. Uh, our next video is going to be Annihilation. Thank you so much. Bye, guys.